let me see if this is working here. What's up, Tyler? I think this is working now. Um, yeah, we are live again for our second, our second um, underwriting. Yeah, week number so, two. Week number two. Um, yeah. So what we did on the first one, we went over uh, an O'Reilly's um, and we drew a couple of different conclusions there. Let's hop into it. What do we have on uh, deck this week, Tyler? Yeah, so this week we're looking at a Starbucks. This one's also in Tennessee. Um, it is in Kingsport, Tennessee. So let me just share my screen here. We can have a have a look at at this beautiful Starbucks. So this Starbucks um, was originally a 15 year that was to be up March renewed on a five year option. So, you know, like many of these, these net lease assets, you give an initial term, maybe it's 10, 15, 20 years, and then you'll typically have a number of five year options afterwards. So, as I said, this, this Starbucks was up in March, it has renewed already. So we're underwriting it as if we were buying it at the, at the renewal, um, net, net operating income that's going to be coming and starting in March. And then just to simplify things, we're assuming we're buying it at that date. So we can, we can start fresh with a, with a new lease. Okay. All right. Well, let me see if I can uh, share this here. I'm sharing your screen now, Tyler. You ready? All right. Yeah. Great. So yeah, yeah this is the Starbucks. Um, it's a relatively, you know, it's, it's a small build, uh, 2000 square foot building on, on just under half an acre. It's, it's a corner lot here in Kingsport. Um, you know, if we back up a bit here, you can see it's in a retail corridor there's all kinds of retail around this is this is actually a great location um because although starbucks has renewed this lease if you know sometime in the future they weren't to renew it you still have a great piece of land here that you could you could use for something else you're not you're not stuck um in the middle of nowhere um do you have any any insights or anything you wanted to talk say about kingsport or you're the tennessee native winston yeah so kingsport's part of the tri-cities um area it's a really cool um area like right on like the virginia uh, line up there uh, in the northeast part of tennessee um you've got um you pull it up it's a little slow here but you've got uh, johnson city you've got kingsport uh and i forget the other one that's over there but it's known as a tri-city uh area and so very close to virginia uh, yeah. North Carolina and in those areas, but beautiful part of the country. Um, we looked at doing some deals there uh, for tenants several years ago and, and nothing ever came to fruition, but it was still, um, you know, I've got a lot of friends from that area and Kingsport's are a really nice, uh, really nice town. And then so, you can kind of see where, where we're at here. It, it's really up, up on the border there. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, specifically about this asset, let me pull up the, the Excel sheet. I mean, it's nice to look at the building, but it's more important to look at the financials that come with the building. So let's pop open this tab. This is a, a simple underwriting Excel sheet. Um, out to the right, you have, you know, the years starting at, at the purchase out all the way out to, you know, 30, 30 years or so, however many years you're going to have cash flows. And then as we talk about certain aspects of the deal, I'll open and close um the tabs here on on the excel sheet so as i said we're looking at starbucks um this starbucks has been on the market for two days it's 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 brand new on the market um it's a 15 was a 15 year initial lease as i said started in march 08 it's terminating in march 23 but they've already renewed for five more years so what you'd be buying is those five years of, of essentially guaranteed cash flows from starbucks and then you would have, we'll, we'll, as we'll look at later, we'll analyze, you know, the, the various situations that can happen five years from now. Um, yeah. Starbucks is guaranteeing this lease. So it's a corporate guarantee, which is important. So, and, and Starbucks is an A minus rated company, which is you know extremely, extremely highly rated. So, I mean, the chance that Starbucks will default um, and you won't get your rental checks, at least for these first five years, which they've, they've committed to is, is, basically zero it's very close to zero for for our purposes i mean we, we can basically treat it as zero mm-hmm. 
That's good. Um, well, a, a few things to note, and we can talk more about Starbucks specifically and the pros and cons of Starbucks. But, um, you know, they, they the building is 15 years old, right? Um, if they've already kind of went through their initial term. Oh, no, they, sorry. They've got five years on their initial term. So the building's 10 years old. Um, it's so, so probably it's 15. A, it is 15. It's 15. Yeah, they're, they just renewed for the first renewal. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Um, so the building's 15 years old. I'm seeing that you've got a trip, a double net here. So we should probably talk a little bit about that. No, no need to go in uh, great detail, but why do you have this as double net versus uh, triple net? Because Starbucks is known to not really have true absolute triple net net leases. Yeah, and that's and that's exactly the point, right? So this has been marketed as a triple net lease. And uh, in my underwriting, I call it a double net plus because an absolute triple net lease is as well, uh, the landlord doesn't do anything, right? The landlord just receives checks in the mails and the tenant yeah. takes care of absolutely everything, right? So on this lease, the tenant is taking care of almost everything except the landlord is still responsible for structure and roof, right? So that net income that comes in isn't a perfect one-to-one um, -one ratio of the cash flow that you're going to have month to month when you consider the fact that you're going to have to reserve a bit of money for eventually when you repair that roof or you do something with that structure. So that's why we're calling it a double net plus lease. It's not an absolute triple net. And I don't want to confuse people into thinking that that's an absolute triple net. And, and then, you know, I'm just receiving the checks and I have absolutely no responsibilities. In this case, you do have a small amount of responsibilities, even though they are minimal. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, sure. So this, this property, um, you know, has an operating income of 107,000 a year. That's starting in March. That's with the new rent bump that's that's coming um, at the renewal. And there, you know, the asking price is a 5.4 cap rate, which equals just shy of, of 2 million bucks, right? Yeah. So when we start looking at this deal, we're gonna start looking at it, at it as if we paid the price they're asking. And then afterwards we can backtrack and, and run some scenarios. But let's assume, you know, let's assume we pay the price they're asking, you know, so we have some simple acquisition um, numbers here. Assume a 1% closing fee. Um, we come down, we look at the operating cash flows. So we've got the 107,000 base rent. Um, the, the way this contract works is every five years, assuming that the tenant re keeps renewing every five years, as they just have, there's a 10% rent, rent bump when that renewal comes through. So there's four, they have, Starbucks has four more options, uh, to renew on this contract. So that would be year six, 11, 16, and 21, if they choose to do so. And there would be 10% oh. bumps each year. And you can see out to the right, how those cash flows in year six, year 11, uh, and so on bump up 10%. And then I've included uh, $2,000 a year, you know, very minimal. Um, you have to actually analyze, you know, the, the, where it's 15 year building, 15 year old building, you know, it'd be nice to actually analyze the building itself, the structure of the roof, you know, see what's been done, what might need to be done before you determine that number of, of how much reserve you want to put aside each year. But you're going to have to pick a small amount of money to put aside um, for eventual repairs that you'll need to do on the on the roof and structure of the building. Um, so those are your operating those are your operating cash flows with Starbucks as your tenant. So those, I mean, uh, down to here, this is pretty this is pretty straightforward, right? We have a, a credit tenant um, with an A rating with some guaranteed cash flows, at least in the first few years. Um, anything you want to add to this part, Winston? You know, what, it's funny, um, you know, we've done a lot of like the development of these and, you know, some selling and, you know, whenever we advertise, um, let's say, let's say we sell something at an eight cap. I remember several years ago, we were selling something and the, the buyer, you know, was, was arguing the cap rate. Um, you know, we just kind of did the NOI uh, at an eight cap uh, and then sold it. And the argument was as well, that's not an eight cap because um, I have to uh, put X number of dollars um, per, per, you know, per year towards unknowns. And really it was the bank, um, you know, advising her to do it, which is, which is good. So there was this, this kind of discussion between the seller and the buyer 
uh, between what is a cap rate. And, you know, uh, the, if you're financing and you're using leverage, your banking partners are probably going to have an opinion on how much you capital you should actually uh, put towards the unknowns in your capital reserve. So, you know, that's going to change depending on bank banks and, and who your advisors are. Um, so it's important that you, you know, that's a low number, I think, that you have there. I think most banks would require more than that. But on the sell side, it's zero, right? Um, you're not you're not putting any there. In this case, because it's just double net, we do need to make sure that you allocate stuff towards it. So I would just, anything that uh, the landlord is responsible for, just make sure you get a couple of different quotes. Uh, push that out over over a year and then also um you know take as you got pointed out here take account of potential yearly uh, increases of those expenses so no other than that just a little bit to add yeah great um that's a great point and a lot of times when you're looking at these deals you know you'll see a broker listing and they'll say you know the net operating income is a hundred thousand dollars a year you really need to dig in and say well what exactly is that hundred thousand dollars a year and what exactly does that include and not include because technically um you know what what you would expect is that net operating income has zero operating expenses but it doesn't include reserves so usually there is a difference between what you call net operating income and what you call um free cash flow from operations right so the free yeah. cash flow from operations is is the difference of that reserve that will go to eventual maintenance. So your any cap X is generally not included in NOI. So when you do your actual calculations of how much money you're going to make, you, you have to include that because you, you, most brokers will not, you know, will not put that there. They'll put the straight NOI with the standard yeah. operating operating expenses, but not the cap X. Absolutely. Okay, so let's get to the to the interesting part here. So this is where things get a little more difficult. Disposition cash flows. So let me just I'll just close these so we can focus in on what we're we're interested in. So here are the disposition cash flows. Um, you need to choose what year you 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 know you think you would dispose of this property. Um, obviously, you could dispose of it earlier. You could you could hold it forever. Um, there's many scenarios here. I'm choosing year ten because it's a relatively because it's a well. First of all, it's a, a renewal year. Um, mm -hmm. And 10 years, you know, if you if you underwrite a property and you're going to dispose of it in three years, well, that, it's, it's going to seem like the property underperforms because you're going to get feed, you know, on both ends, both in the purchase and the sale. Um, and your returns aren't going to be as good just because you're not giving it enough time to, to make money. And if you go too long, well, I mean, how can we really project, you know, even 10 years is, is pretty far in the future to project. So, you know, in that five to 10 year range is usually a good a good. Uh, area to project your disposition, you know, regardless of what will actually happen, right? So I've got a number of scenarios here. Um, one scenario is that Starbucks, you know, will will renewal uh, for all four of their renewals into the future. Um, and, you know, you'll sell this, you'll sell this property freshly renewed, similar to the, similar to the way that you're, you're uh, buying it now. Um, yeah. There's some other scenarios where Starbucks leaves and, you know, we have to Retenant the building, so there's probably some costs there in order to get the building ready for a different tenant. There's this, you know, there's a scenario where you have to knock the building down and just put up a whole new structure. And there's a, there's scenarios where you know positive side scenarios where um, the land just goes up in value tremendously, and you're able to, you know, retenant it at a at a market rate much higher than you know what you're doing right now. So these are all scenarios. For now, we're going to stick with the first scenario, which is Starbucks stays. Um, I don't think it's a hundred percent, but it's it's pretty high probability that 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 they'll stay at least for a while if they've been there for fifteen years and they've already committed to another five. It's reasonably likely that they'll continue in this spot um, unless something drastic changes. So we'll look at that scenario first, and then later we'll come back and we'll change these probabilities for different scenarios. Okay. So scenario one, um, which is currently a hundred percent probability where Starbucks uh, will renew, you know, they'll renew five years again, they'll renew five years again. So 10 years from now, when you dispose of it, you're disposing of it, of the property in the exact same basically condition um, or, or contract condition that you're purchasing it right now, right? So yeah. the rent at that time will be $130,000, the NOI, sorry. 
Um, we're going to keep the same exit cap rate because even though the building will typically you would you would increase the exit cap rate versus the cap rate you're buying at a little bit each year. But where this building is already aged a bit, um, you're probably going to have to you know do some maintenance to it. I wouldn't expect the condition to deteriorate that much. And you're purchasing it under almost the exact situ the exact scenario that you'd be selling it under. So I'm, I'm more comfortable in this case using an exit cap rate equal to the cap rate we're buying at. Whereas in many other cases, I'd probably want to add at least, you know, maybe five, two to five basis points per year. Yeah, you know, um, I think you're right. I think it's a fair. But, but I mean, this is this is like the crystal ball. Everybody wants to know the future. Um, we don't know it. You know, I will say. You know, lender rates are ranging around six and a half percent as we're I think it's probably scrolling on the on the screen right now. And the cap rate environment today is changing, uh, changing rapidly. So, you know, I, I was on a call today um, about some some new deals that we're doing and just talking cap rates and what may or may not happen. And um, and so you don't ever know what the cap rates are going to be. A lot of people would never have thought um, that you know, beginning of 2021 cap rates would have compressed the way that they did. So um, it's fair to kind of, it's fair to kind of go with the cap rate that you, you see today uh, and kind of how you're underwriting this. Um, but different people have different opinions. So it's important, important to point that out. Yeah, great point, great point. Um, and in the case that, for example, I, I to, to add to that point as well, we're assuming that we're going to buy this at a 5.4 cap because that's what it's listed at, right? Um, but if we were to buy it at a six cap, because I think, you know, we think the market will will take that, I would also put a six cap here in my exit, right? I wouldn't keep this as a 5.4 cap. Um, so whatever assumption we we change on the, on the buying, I'd also want to change here. And probably you're right, Winston. I mean, we're probably going into an environment where cap rates have, well, they definitely have pressure to go up now we'll see what actually happens so they're, we, they're might, going we up. could be they're yeah, going we, up. <laughs> we could be more conservative here <laughs> as well um so in this scenario right we got to, we're, we're using 100 percent for this uh right now um that's going to get us down to you know 2.4 million at sale um in year 10 with a two point nearly 2.3 million uh net reversion right after selling fees so if we look at how this pans out, right? So here's the IRR analysis, um, both levered and unlevered. I think Winston, you were saying loans today are, are coming in about 6.5, 6.5%. Um, yeah, so the unlevered, you know, these are your cash flows. We're looking at, you know, kind of typical loan assumptions here using a 70% 70, 70 Seventy percent leverage, six point five percent rate, twenty-five year amortization. Um, you know, you'd be buying this property. You know, with about a one point four million loan, six hundred thousand in cash. Um, the unlevered IRR for this deal at at the rate and uh, that they're asking, and at you know, with all the assumptions that we've made, is six and a half percent. And then the multiplier on your initial capital. Is about 1.7x. So you put, you know, 600,000 in today, you're going to get, you know, 70% more than that back 10 years from now when, when this whole thing is over. So, you know, it's, you know, it's a deal um, from a, you know, credit tenant. Um, it's not a bad return, you know. Um, you could get, you know, if you want to take on more risk in a different situation, you can get higher return if you wanted to take on less risk and maybe buy a 10 year treasury or, or whatever you could get less return. But I think the risk profile of the tenant in this deal, you know, this kind of return is not, not unreasonable. I think it's, it's, you know, in the ballpark. Well, yeah, you know, Tyler, I think one, one thing uh, where we'd maybe push back is what we were saying, talking about before is the disposition cap rate, maybe in year 10. Um, you know, keep in mind that in year 10, your, your NOI has increased 2% on average per year, right? Um, but maybe you do sell it at a higher cap rate, uh, thereby a lower price. 
what would that look like? Say, be, say maybe at like a six cap, if we had to sell it at a six cap. That'd bring, your, that'd bring down your unleveraged IRR to 5.7 and then your leveraged IRR because rates are getting expensive on, on uh, you know, debt's getting expensive is down to just over 4%, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, the reason why I'm bringing that up is, um, you know, things do change and no one knows what 10 years down the road will be. Um, but I would say that you do want to play with this and kind of understand what that does, what the potential does um, to the return. So, cool. Perfect. Um, so staying on that, let's move down a little bit here and let's, let's continue with this scenario just for a little bit longer, oh, okay. which is the scenario that, you know, Starbucks stays. And do let's we keep it at a, do we keep it at a six cap or do we change it back to the, we're so we can leave it at a six cap because we're going to buy it cheaper um, down here. So I, I got, we might even actually increase the cap rate. We're going to sell it at in this scenario. Okay. So, so what we've got here, you know, after we did the initial IRR analysis, which is basically just, you know, assuming we're going to purchase it at this rate, you know, here's the deal. What we're doing here is we're actually going to discount the cash flows um, based on what we think they're worth. Right. So, you know, Today you can buy, you can get a corporate bond, you know, double A rated for nearly five percent, triple B for five seventy five. So you know, Starbucks probably somewhere be somewhere around a five point five. Um, so we can start to use these numbers to discount the cash flows and figure out at what cap rate we think it's worth it uh, to buy this this property um, based on the other options, risk risk similar options in the market, right? Yep. So. You know, just starting there, if, you know, you can buy a similarly rated bond, um, corporate bond, which is has more liquidity at five and a half percent. Well, those income cash flows, you're probably going to want, you know, at least, you know, a little more. And then those disposition cash flows, you're definitely going to want more because there's uncertainty there as to whether Starbucks will even stick around and you might even have to retain it. Right. So, you know, if we assume that. We give ourselves 25 basis points of liquidity premium and another, you know, another 100 basis points um, for the disposition. Well, our, our suggested purchase price has come down from 5.4 cap to about a 5.7 cap, right? So, and that's, you know, that's the scenario that's working with the scenario of a, a, a six, a six cap exit. So, you know, in this scenario, if we were to purchase it at a 5.7 cap and exit at a six cap, our levered and unlevered IRR is a little bit better, right? We got a six and a half unlevered and just over 7% levered IRR. And, you know, our leverage return on capital, we're nearly doubling our cash in 10 years. So, mm -hmm. you know, if we, if we use this MPV analysis rather than just straight buying what the, what the asking price is, we can see that, you know, if we get a discount on this purchase for what we consider reasonable and we could logically rationally defend this um, based on other investments in the market, our returns a little bit better. Yep. Yep. Good. So the last thing that we're going to do here is take a quick look at some of these scenarios. So uh, until now, the only thing we've done is assume that Starbucks is going to stay. But we should also assume that there's a chance that we have to do scenario two, which is an adaptive reuse. In which case, maybe we'll spend, yeah, maybe we'll spend $75 a square foot to get it ready for a new tenant with, you know, these are, these are numbers, kind of just typical average numbers we're using here. Well, we'd obviously have to, you know, dig a little deeper into the kind of the, the rates in the area. And, and who we think we might, you know, need to contract to do this and, and what have you. But, you know, if we assume also a six cap exit rate, we assume we spend $75 um, dollars per square foot for an adaptive reuse. You know, this is a different scenario. So maybe we can, we can instead of 100%, you know, we use 90% that Starbucks will renew. You know, 
uh, let's say 7.5 that we need to do an adaptive reuse and 2.5 that we need to actually tear it down and build it, right? Mm -hmm. So what we need to do here is, you know, figure out what type of NOI we'll expect at that point in the future, which is based on market rate and market increase. So specifically in this situation, what we'd really need to do is do a market analysis um, of the area, look at market rents, uh, and project how much per year we think those are going to go up. Now, this is assuming about a two, two and a half percent increase per year. Um, and then we stick a new tenant in there at year 10 and that new tenant, you know, signs a lease and then we'll exit at a six cap for the case of an adaptive reuse and we'll exit at a five, seven, five cap at the case of a, a brand new build, right? Um, yep. Those, so those three scenarios all give you different disposition, dis, disposition sales. So in the first case, you're getting just over 2 million. In the second case, you're getting 1.9. In the third case, about 1.7. So when we average those together based on our probabilities here, um, our disposition that sales revenue is just, you know, a little bit less than it would have been in the first scenario. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's important to kind of uh, think about the possibilities. So, and let's be clear, most people are not doing a Monte Carlo analysis or, or, or is this a Monte Carlo? No, this is no. which one? This is just Sorry. scenario analysis. Yeah. Yeah. This is just a scenario analysis. Excuse me. So most people aren't doing that. Uh, we recommend it. And this is a time out here. Uh, Tyler, you're not in a war zone, right? You're just, they're celebrating the world. <laughs> Cup. Is that, is there's that a, going? there's fireworks going off in the background. They're celebrating. <laughs> I don't know. I think Argentina just lost or something. I have no idea. <laughs> All right. So, um, yeah, most people don't go this extra step, and that's fine. You know, you, everyone uh, does their analysis different, but uh, we, we like to take this into account just to get a good, true look um, at the probabilities. So depending yeah, on the and, tenant, you get someone like Starbucks, high credit, um, growing like crazy. I think they're projected to, to expand by like 2,000 stores in the next three or five years. I forget what that number is. Um, it doesn't feel like Starbucks is going anywhere, um, mm -hmm. but you never know. So, yeah, you're and you're 100 right on that. For this, you know, for this particular case, you could probably just you know stick with the standard scenario: the Starbucks stays there, and you'll be fine. This becomes very important when your when your tenant has a reasonable probability of leaving. One and two, when you're not sure what you're going to do if a tenant leaves. So in this situation yep. where we have Starbucks, which is a great tenant, and second, we have a great location that would easily be, you know, adapted for a new tenant. This isn't is this this risk downside risk is far far less, and we we can we can gloss over this a bit quicker than we would if we had a, a higher risk um, asset that we were underwriting. Cool. So let me just go down quickly and see with this new scenario how that how that's changed our our, our outlook. You know, it drives down the we're not even looking at the IRR anymore. We'll look at the MPV. So, you know, it it does bring us down a little bit. Um, not much, though, you know, because we left the probability very high that Starbucks would stay in. So we're still up over a 7% levered IRR. And we're still, uh, you know, nearly a 2x return on capital for this, you know, mm -hmm. for a, a very high credit tenant. Yeah, and look, today, in today's environment, there's a lot of deals starting to be had for all cash buyers who, who will close quickly. Um, you know, what do a lot of people do? Um, they may buy all cash today when the rates are high. Uh, and, then, and then when the rates are low, they'll refi, pull money out, and then they start to have, you know, kind of a blended uh, leverage return, right? So um there's a lot of different strategies it's impossible to show them all on here but this gives you a look for both the unlevered and the leveraged uh and most people are going to be leveraged but there are a lot of cash all cash deals going on today yep cool so do we buy it tyler what you know what type of buyer should we, buy this do we buy what kind of buyer should buy this so, you know, buy, a buyer that a buyer that likes having cash flow in their portfolio. So I mean, some buyers don't care about cash flow. They just want, mm -hmm. you know, they just want they just want growth, maximum growth. I got 30 years. I just want to grow that stuff. They might be more interested in high and you know high risk equities. But someone who wants, you know, a stable tenant like Starbucks is going to pay their bills every month. Um, they want that cash flow because they, you know, they use it for something. 
Um, and then also they, they want the appreciation, um, steady, steady and slow appreciation of the, of the contract and of the property. You know, this is, this is a good deal, um, for someone who wants that's that particular thing and someone who, you know, can use real estate in their portfolio, um, to decorrelate from maybe some other things they have. Maybe they have some fixed income, maybe they have some stocks, um, and real estate is, you know, something they want to add in the mix to make their overall portfolio a bit less volatile. Absolutely. Uh, and those are good points, Tyler. One thing that this does not and uh, take into account, we, we need to remind everyone, is that this does not take into account someone's um, tax situation. Uh, there are advantages, as everyone knows, in purchasing real estate. Um, you know, did you, you know, are you able to depreciate this in maybe um, a certain fashion? Um, depending on what your your CPA set, says or advises, um, you know, are you rolling over 1031 money and deferring taxes? So that return, leveraged or unleveraged, um, may actually be quite a bit greater, right, than uh, than what we have here. Uh, but everyone's tax situation is different, so it's impossible, pretty much, for us to um, determine that, right? Um, but that's one of the benefits of buying real estate over just just uh, government bonds, right? Um, is, is some of the advantages of real estate. So anyhow, is that all you got for us today, Tyler? Yeah, I think that's it. Good. Well, if anyone's interested, contact us. Let us know. We'd be happy to help you or talk more about uh, triple net or net leased assets. Have a good one, Tyler. All right. Cheers, Winston. So.